Right. Uh, yeah. Welcome to welcome to session two. Uh, so for this session, we'll be having presentations by uh, PhDs, MSCs, uh, and then we'll, at the end we'll have a Q and A session. So for this session, we'll also have a, a voting um, option uh, via the polling system. So uh, you'll get to vote for at the end for your favorite or uh, PhD or MSc presentation, and uh, please only vote for you know a session for this session if you attended this session. Uh, otherwise, if you attended, if you are, if you, are, you, are, you didn't attend the breakaway room, please only vote for this one. Um, so, our first uh, presentation will be by Toluana, uh, who is a PhD student. Good day, my name is Tulwana and I'll be presenting on the taxonomic diversity and distribution of the freshwater fishes of the Zambezian Lowfelt ecoregion. Freshwater ecoregions are large areas encompassing one or more freshwater systems with a distinct assemblage of natural freshwater communities and species. There are 22 freshwater ecoregions in southern Africa and the Zambezian Lowfelt ecoregion has the highest freshwater fish species diversity. The ZLE is defined by the low-lying portions of the coastal river system south of the Zambezi Delta to the Tugela. Nine major river basins drain the ecoregion from north to south along the Indian Ocean coastline. These are the Pungwe, Buzi, Save, Limpopo, Ingomati, Pongola, Kuze, Mtlatuzi, and Tugela rivers. The fish fauna in the ZLE system changes from predominantly Zambezian in the north to temperate in the south, with the Limpopo, Inkomati, and Pongola systems being the transition zone where the southern tributaries host the first temperate species such as Enteromus anopolis and Modebensis and Libiopavas polylepis. Knowledge on the taxonomic diversity and distribution of the freshwater fishes of the ZLE is regarded as largely incomplete, and it is likely the reason why a number of the ZLE fish fauna are listed as least concerned and widely distributed. However, genetic and morphological studies such as the ones by Make, Mazungula and Chakona and Crema are showing that many species that were previously considered to have wide distribution ranges are instead species complexes often comprising of several narrow-ranged li lineages or candidate species. Therefore, the present study aims to review the research history and synthesize the available information on species diversity and distribution of the ZLE freshwater fishes as part of a gap analysis study. Literature on the fishes of the ZLE were obtained from Google Scholar, the Biodiversity Heritage Library and Key Ideological Information Repositories, and in particular the Margaret Smith Library and Collection Database at the NRF South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. Ishkimia's catalog of fishes was used to verify the valid genus and species, and the IUCN Red List Assessment was used to check for the IUCN status. There are currently 103 freshwater fishes found in the nine major river basins of the ZLE. Day is the most species family with 35 species, followed by Day with 12 and Day with 11 species. 53 of these species were described from this region, while 20 of the fishes found in this ecoregion are endemic to one or two river systems. 77% of the ZLE fish fauna are classified as least concern, largely due to the perceived wide geographic ranges. However, in a number of families that are recorded in the ZLE, there are species complexes which are yet to be resolved. For example, the revision of species that were previously classified under Petrocephalus catostoma were shown to be valid or new species. However, the study did not include specimens from the lower survey. Therefore, the validity of these fishes as petrocephalus catostoma in the survey is still unresolved. Species complexes are also evident in labiobarbus, 
namely Librobarus natalensis and Mariquensis. However, molecular evidence from Librobarus natalensis has shown that it is a species complex. One of the issues that dominated in the taxonomy of the ZLE fishes was the limited number of specimens for identification. Therefore, in cases where there was phenotypic overlap, as in the case of labial barbers, it was more difficult to reach a consensus on the taxonomic classification of the species. Therefore, to aid species discovery and taxonomic resolution of the species complexes, we need to increase exploration of the ZLE systems and incorporate integrative methods to identify the fishes of the ZLE. I would like to thank the following institutions and people for their valued contribution to this project. Thank you very much, uh, Tolana. Uh, our next presentation will be by Martinez, uh, who is also a PhD student. Good morning, everyone. I'm Martinez, and Thanks for listening to my talk about the molecular phylogeny of Southern African diploid barbs in the genus Enteromius using DNA barcoding. The small diploid African barbs are cyprinids consisting of the genera Barboidus, Barbopsis, Ecobarbus, Clipibarbus, and Enteromius. Enteromius was until recently classified as barbus, which included species from Africa, Asia, and Europe. And barbus included over 800 species. Oh, yeah. In 2015, Yang et al. resurrected Enteromius to distinguish the small African diploid barbs from the Asian true barbus. But this genus still consists of more than 220 species, with, with new species regularly being described or revalidated. But the relationship between species in, in, in Enteromius are not well known. And only two studies have been done, which focused on the Central and West African species. Our main aim was to understand the relationship between Southern African barbs and also to those from the rest of the continent with the CO1-based phylogeny of 43 species. We only use sequences derived from turpotype specimens, and this will become clearer a bit later. Professor Skelton proposed the preliminary classification of barbs to aid in future taxonomic decisions based on the morphology of the primary dorsal fin ray. He proposed three groups, and they were the saw fin, spine fin, and soft rayed barbs. And we wanted to see whether these groups do form natural groupings. These are the type localities of the species we used, and we've got a range from Ethiopia to Cameroon to South Africa. Our results showed that enteromius could be broken up into three main clades. Um, clade one appears to be your more robust uh, species, um, and they include quite a few of the sawfins. Clade two is medium sized in general. Um, and they include soft rays and sawfin barbs. Clade three are generally your smaller species, um, but there are a couple of large ones, and they're all soft rays except for a few spine fins. Geographically, this is what it would look like. Clade one is in yellow, clade two in purple, and clade three in green. And there's not any real geographic distinctions between the clades. Looking at the fins, one can see that the saw fins occur in clade one and two, and the soft rays in all the clades, so they do not form natural groupings. So to get back to why we only used specimens collected from their type localities, this is a quick tree I drew for enteromius pallidinosis from specimens collected throughout its currently known distribu distributional range. One can clearly see that they differentiate quite nicely based on where they were collected from. And it's quite likely that we might have to revalidate or redescribe 
the species collected from the Congo, Tanzania, Upper Limpopo, the Orange, and then the Lower Limpopo and in, in, in Kamati systems. And this will form part of some of my next chapters for my PhD. To end off, we need much more work is needed to resolve the taxonomy of Interomius. We know that Interomius is not monophyletic. Clipiobarbus and Barboides is embedded within the genus. So it's likely that Interomius will be broken into more genera as more information becomes available. Increased taxon sampling is necessary, as well as the inclusion of more loci to understand what unites the different clades. At the moment, we don't have a clear idea of what that is. With the inclusion of more ta taxa and loci, the relationships may well change, but this study hopefully provides a framework for future taxonomic decisions. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the talks. All right, uh, our next uh, present presentation is by Manda, who is a PhD student. Hello, everyone. Today, I will be talking to you about our recently published work titled Allopatric Differentiation in the Enteromia Sonoplast Complex in South Africa with the revalidation of Enteromia senius. Entromias orionensis and a description of the new species Entromias mandelae. The genus Entromias from the family Cyprinidae represents a non monophyletic group that includes most small sized African diploid barbs. It contains over 200 valid species, making it the second largest fish genus in Africa and the third largest in the world. Over 20 Enteromia species are found in South Africa. Some of the Enteromia species in South Africa belong to two broad groups. The body barb group, which have relatively small compact bodies, two pairs of barbels and bright golden male breeding livery, and the chubby barb group, which differ mainly in the male breeding colors and tubercles. Of the four species previously found in the chubby barb group, only Enteromia sonopus had a wide distribution range. So these formerly widespread species will be the focus of my talk today. The use of a comprehensive data set of mitochondrial cytochrome B sequences uncovered the presence of four distinct lineages within Enteromia sonopus. A comprehensive number of specimens from the Oliphant River system, Orange River system, Ruiz River system, and various river systems across the Chabed Barbs range in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa were collected. The cytochrome B gene was used in molecular analysis, and methods used to obtain morphometric and linguistic data follows Chakona 2014 and Skelton 1988. The present study found genetic evidence to separate Enteromia sanoplas sensulatu into four distinct and allopatrically distributed species. These were Enteromia sanoplas sensu strictu, endemic to the Huiz River system, Enteromia orinensis, endemic to the Orange River system, Enteromia senuis, endemic to the Oliphant River system, and Enteromia mandelae, which is widely distributed in several coastal river systems in South Africa's Eastern Cape province. Logical findings agree with Bannon's 1943 separation of these species, with key distinguishing characters among them being differences in bubble length, number of pod lateral line scales, and circumpendicular scales. Entromeus rhinensis is readily separated from the other three species by having inconspicuous bubbles and an incomplete lateral line. Entromeus senuis has the longest bubble length which surpass the middle portion of the eye, a complete lateral line, and the lowest number of circumpendicular scales. Enteromia sanoplas has an incomplete lateral line and a relatively short bubbles that do not surpass the vertical through the middle of the eye and the highest number of circumpendicular scales. 
In Taurus, Mandelae has a complete lateral line and relatively shorter bubbles than in Tauromia sinuis. This study, along with other studies on freshwater fishes in South Africa, have uncovered hidden diversity. This has resulted in changes in special patterns of species richness and endemism, with endemism being found in these river systems. For example, in the Oliphant River system, where Entromia senius was revalidated, there is distinctive fish fauna, with 10 of the 11 fish species in this system being endemic. Only a few species in this area have distribution ranges covering more than one river system. Most fish species are narrow range endemics confined to a single river system. The present study revealed allopatric genetic divergence and consistent differences in bubble length and scale counts, supporting the designation of the four lineages identified within Enjoyment Sonoplas sensulatu as distinct taxonomic entities. As only part of the distribution range of the Enjoyment Sonoplas complex was examined, it is possible that the species richness of the Enjoyment Sonoplas complex may be underestimated. For example, the taxonomic integrity of Enjoyment Sonoplas in the Umgeni River system, where Enjoyment Cacensis was discovered, remains unclear. Thank you all for listening. Right, ne next up is Anam Tombeni, who is an MSc student. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'll be presenting distribution of the freshwater fishes in the Kong River system in the Eastern Cape province. Freshwater ecosystems have a high diversity of species and provide important ecosystem services, and they are among the most threatened ecosystems as a result of human activities. The Cape Coral ecoregion in the southern tip of Africa is a biodiversity hotspot with relatively small and geographically isolated river systems. This region has received considerable research focus because of its high levels of biodiversity and high endemism for freshwater fishes, majority of which are under severe threat of extinction. Work by Elenda et al. 2017 has shown that the streams within this region are subject to major induced changes, including but not limited to damming, excessive water abstraction, and the introduction of non-native fishes. The Plum River system is one of the important river systems in the Eastern Cape province because it is being highly modified by the contraction of wells and impoundments, and there are species restricted to this system. It contains three native freshwater fish species, Pseudobacus centriceps, that was recently described by Chabon and Skelton in 2017 from a review of the Pseudobacus apha species complex and Galaxias zebrapus. The two taxa are listed under the threatened category of the IUCN wet list, whereby Pseudobacus centriceps is listed as critically endangered and Galaxias zebrapus is listed as endangered. Pseudobacus centriceps has narrow distribution range and is restricted to the Bomb River system. While the third species, Sandelia capensis, is currently listed as data deficient, the most recent information indicates that the species comprises of three allopatric lineages and the Bomb River population represents one of the separate lineages. Some of the identified threats in the Plum River include the presence of non-native species and the human-made physical barriers, together with the intensive agricultural activities taking place at the Plum River catchment. The problem facing these highly modified threatened species is that um, they are in continuously modified landscapes, and with the ongoing work that is being done, there is discovery of new species and lineages, some of which were thought to be um, widely distributed are actually narrow range endemics. 
and there is a challenge with managing them because there is lack of ecological information to guide their conservation. Therefore, the aim of the present study was to compare the historical and current distribution ranges of the different species and lineages in the Kwam River system. Distribution data was collected from the Kwam River and the augmented by the historical data that was sourced from the NRF SIEP database. Distribution maps were created to show the ranges of the species, whether they increased or decreased as compared to their historical distribution ranges. And from the results, the distribution of Sirubaba centiceps was historically distributed across the Kwam River system downstream section in the middle section of Main Sam and the upper section of the river. But currently, the distribution shows that the remnant population of the Grand River Redfin persists in short stretches uh, of the river section, draining the least impacted and uninvited, uninvaded catchments above the areas that prevent the, ma the upstream migration of man native fish species. A similar pattern can be seen with Sandelia capensis that was historically found in the main stem localities of the river, but because of um, the habitat de destruction and the introduction of the non-native species, this population have declined and the species is now moving towards the upper section of the river. The main stem localities are now occupied by the two introduced non-native species, the large mouth bass and the bluegill sunfish. It is clear from uh, the distribution maps that over the years this system has been affected by the construction of waves and the introduction of non-native species and this has resulted in the decrease in the current distribution ranges of these native species and these tags are now fragmented compared to their historical distribution. Therefore, the long-term conservation measures should focus on preventing the spread of non-native species and rehabilitating the critical habitat for future persistence of remnant population of native species. I would like to acknowledge the following paper. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Tulusile, who is an MSc student. Good day, my name is Tulisi Lengomo and I am an MSc student. Stable isotope analysis is increasingly becoming a preferred alternative tool in trophic ecology studies and has been shown when evaluating the trophic ecology of species that occur either in seam pantry or in allopatry. This study evaluates the trophic patterns and food drop ecology of Sandile Benza using stable isotope analysis. Recent molecular studies have revealed the occurrence of three divergent lineages within Sandela Benzai. These are Sandela Benzai Kiskama, occurring in the Kiskama River, Sandela Benzai Kowi, occurring in the Kowi and Great Fish River systems, and Sandela Benzai Buffalo, confined to the Buffalo and Agoda systems. These lineages therefore represent closely related taxa that occur in allopatry. Studies have shown that congeneric allopatric species occurring in similar environments are likely to exhibit similar trophic niche patterns due to niche conservatism. The objectives of the study were to examine bird patterns of the food web dynamics and habitats where the three Sanilla benza lineages occur, determine the isotopic niche patterns of each Sanilla benza lineage from the three river systems, and evaluate the interspecific interactions of the Sanilla Benza lineages with other co-occurring species. Sampling was conducted in the headwater streams of the Great Fish River, Kiskama River, and Buffalo River. To examine food web patterns and trophic niche relationships, potential basal food sources, macroinvertebrates, and fish were collected. The results showed that in terms of food web patterns within the Great Fish River system, 
The three sites where Sanela Benzakoi was captured exhibited a wide variation in the stable isotope values for the different trophy groups. The Lashington River was distinguished by narrow carbon values for basal sources, and the Fairburn River was distinguished by narrow nitrogen values for invertebrates. Consequently, the Lashington River was most distinguished by a high nitrogen range, which indicated a high trophic diversity with corresponding low trophic redundancy. Generally, a large nitrogen range amongst consumers suggests more trophic levels and thus a greater degree of trophic diversity. The Fairburn River community was most distinguished by a high carbon range, which indicated a wide range in basal sources with corresponding low trophic redundancy. Consequently, the lineage used isotopic niche was largest in the Lashington River and smallest in the Fairburn River. Similarly, Sanella Benza Kiskama was found in rivers that significantly varied in its carbon values for both basal sources and macroinvertebrates. In comparison, Sanella Benza Buffalo was found in a system characterized by a wide breadth in carbon values for both basal sources and invertebrates. All three rivers exhibited a narrow, a narrow nitrogen breadth for invertebrates. The Kiskama River community, where Sanella Banzai Kiskama co occurred with Imendelai, was characterized by high values in its carbon range and nitrogen range. This indicated a high trophic diversity within the Kiskama community with corresponding low trophic redundancy. Consequently, Sanella Banzai Kiskama exhibited variable isotopic niche sizes in this community with its smallest isotopic niche in the Kume 1 locality and its largest isotopic niche in the Kume 2 locality. By comparison, the Buffalo River had low CR values indicating a low range of basal sources and an intermediate NR value suggesting an intermediate trophic diversity with corresponding high trophic redundancy. As a result, Sanila Benza Buffalo had a large isotopic niche in comparison to the Cat River, where both species co occurred with two other species. And the isotopic niche uh, for Sanila Benza Buffalo exhibited low probabilities of interspecific overlap onto the isotopic niche of both E. Mendeley and A. Chevliani. The study hypothesized that the three lineages of Sanila Banzai are likely to show similar trophic ecology patterns that are consistent with niche conservatism. However, the results showed that the river systems occupied by the three Sanila Banzai lineages vary in their full drift characteristics, possibly due to di differences in resource availability, spatial heterogeneity, and land use patterns in the different streams which subsequently influence the community structure and isotopic niche sizes exhibited by the three different lineages as well as the trophic interrelationships of Sanela Benza lineages with other co-occurring fish species. Characterizing the trophic ecology and food drip patterns of the three allopatrically distributed lineages within Sanela Benza will assist in identifying whether these lineages should be identified as new species. The results may be used to understand whether these lineages are found in rivers characterized by similar food web patterns and whether they exhibit similar trophic ecology patterns. Thank you. Our next presenter is Oliver Olutiduna, who is a PhD student. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be talking to you about the effect of easterly and westerly winds on the settlement of mussel and barnacle larvae. Alongshore winds are dominant on the southeast coast of South Africa and potentially have an impact on the ocean currents and thereafter organisms that are found in the ocean. Organisms such as mussels and barnacles have a biphasic life cycle whereby the larvae are found in the ocean and have to return to the shore for settlement. These larvae are delivered to the shore through ocean currents, which is in turn influenced by wind. The aim of this study was to evaluate the connection between larvae, delivery, and wind. The study site 
The study was carried out in Port Elizabeth, Algoa Bay, which is now known as Gabeja. Six sites were selected, two on the western side of the bay, two within the bay, and two on the eastern side. On the west, you would find School Market Corp, Chelsea Point. Within the bay will be Algoa West, Algoa East, and on the east will be Canon Rocks and Canton on Sea. These sites lie parallel to the dominant wind regimes found in this region. Scouring pads, like the yellow one you see on the photo on the left, were used as artificial settlement material for mussel larvae and PVC plates with sandpaper, as shown on the picture on the right, were used for barnacle larvae. These were placed between mussel and barnacle beds. The artificial collectors were replaced monthly and, and wind was uh, taken or retrieved from South African Weather Services. How did one uh, take easterly or westerly wind? It was the number of hours that either wind was blowing in the same direction for the previous two days before sampling. Then we determined that sampling day Easterly or westerly, depending on those two previous two days. The table below, the table shown here, shows uh, the number of hours of either west, either wind, which is westerly or easterly, and its effects on the abundance of each taxon and ontogenic stage per site, as it's shown in, in the brackets. Those are the sites written in brackets. As you can see. The number of hours of easterly wind had a significant effect on the late stages of mussels and both ontogenic stages of barnacle abundances. That is, you can see on this column here. The number of hours of westerly wind, however, on the other hand, had a significant effect on all the taxa and all the ontogenic stages. The effect of both wind regimes on the abundance differed per site. As you can see, there was no effect of easterly wind here, but there was here. And the effect of easterly wind on Penapena recruits was in Boardwalk, Brighton Beach, and Canton on Sea, whilst the westerly wind was in Brighton Beach and Canton on Sea. Wind induced processes such as turbulence, which is the fluid motion and drastic changes in velocity of water through the water column, and upwelling which is the rising of bottom cold and nutrient-rich waters to the surface, replacing the surface water which will be moving offshore, had significant effects on settlement abundances. Upwelling positively correlated with settlement and turbulence negatively correlated with settlement abundances. This presumes that abundances increased with upwelling as it brings more nutrients, whilst the negative relationship between turbulence and abundances suggested that organisms preferred calmer waters, which definitely would increase settlement chances. Wind therefore directly and indirectly affected settlement, as the number of hours showed a direct impact of wind, and the wind-driven processes would show the indirect effect of on settlement. Wind and therefore wind induced factors do play an important role in population connectivity in this region, particularly for mussels and barnacles. I would like to thank my supervisors, my sponsors, people who assisted in the fieldwork, and everyone who contributed in ensuring that the project was a success. Thank you very much. Up next is Suzanne, who is also a PhD student. Hello, and thank you for listening to my presentation on my PhD project titled Use of 16S rRNA Gene Analysis for the Characterization of the Bacterial Composition of the Gut Microbiome of the Cape Sea Urchin Parachinus angulosus. For my PhD study, I decided to take a look at sea urchin culture. Based on the success of overseas echinoculture, I wanted to create a method to use in the determination of which sea urchin populations are fittest, from which broodstock can be collected for culture. South Africa would benefit from the introduction of echinoculture because urchin gonadal tissue, more appetizingly called uni, 
is used in the sushi industry, for which overseas markets will pay top dollar, making this a valuable potential candidate for export. I chose the Cape Sea Urchin Paracinus angulosus due to its broad distribution and, as a result, the wide range of environmental conditions the species as a whole is exposed to along the South African coastline. Though P. angulosus is not an edible species, this investigative protocol can be applied to any species globally. To that end, the central question that my study aims to answer is how we can determine the best populations from which to collect broodstock for culture. And for this, I have designed a three-pronged study. Chapter 1 is the investigation of the phylogenetic relationships between populations. Chapter 2, a morphometric study in the form of an allometric study. And Chapter 3, which is the focus of today's presentation, is the determination of gut bacterial communities and sea urchins. Chapter 3 specifically sets out to answer whether intestinal bacterial communities can be an indicator of population health, and so inform on which population to choose for broodstock. So let's consider sea urchins and why they're important. Sea urchins belong to the Echinodermata phylum, and like many other grazers, fill the critical role of ecosystem engineer through modifying habitat characteristics and the introduction of nutrient-rich fecal pellets, on which fellow rocky shore vertebrates and invertebrates feed. Their mouth is positioned ventrally, through which algae and biological detritus is taken in, which is excreted through the anus at the top of the urchin. The esophagus and gut are of special importance, because we now know that the optimal functioning of these systems is critical to the health of the host organism. Bacteria in the digestive system can aid or harm the efficiency of nutrient uptake from the bolus, which of course affects the somatic and sexual growth of the organism. Analyzing the bacterial community and determining which species are critical to the optimal function of the urchin can help inform on population health, which goes towards answering my research question. To investigate bacterial community composition, I collected 10 urchins from each of 41 sites. The method used to investigate bacterial communities is 16S ribosomal RNA analysis. 16S refers to the gene within the bacterial DNA composition that is favored for this kind of analysis. Within that gene, there are eight conserved regions of DNA, which is of no use to us, and nine hypervariable regions, which we focus on. Among the hypervariable regions, 16S analysis focuses on the fourth and fifth regions, which are 400 to 500 base pairs long. Extracted, amplified, and purified products were viewed on a gel, which indicates the success of the amplification process. Successful samples were sequenced using MySeq sequencing and the results analyzed in Mother and R. This graph shows the number of sequences of bacteria from each sample indicated here in orange, alongside urchin DNA indicated here in blue. What's happening here is that the urchin DNA is similar enough in the regions to which the primers bind that the DNA is being co-amplified with the bacterial DNA. We are looking at ways to hopefully improve the specificity of the bacterial 16S rRNA PCR reaction in order to minimize co-amplification of urchin genes. This graph takes a look at all the bacterial phyla in the orange section of the bars in the previous slide, and we can see that proteobacteria, cyanobacteria, and bacteroidota phyla dominate these sequence numbers. From these preliminary results, it seems that the community composition of the gut bacteria remains the same in spite of the wide range of conditions the species experiences. The implication of this is that broodstock can be collected from any population, and equally important, that the species offers some resilience against climate change as a result of its wide distribution. In using the 16S method, among others, this project has a well-rounded investigative approach which will aid in identifying the optimal population from which to collect broodstock for culture. Next up, we have Sajni Reddy, MSc. Good day, everyone. My presentation is based on my master's, titled Larval Assemblages in Intertidal Habitats, the Use of Artificial and Natural Structures. Intertidal habitats host a unique range of biodiversity and are important as nursery areas for different larval and juvenile invertebrate and fish species. This is due to the presence of microhabitats, such as rock pools, crevices and gullies. These offer refuge from physical stresses and predation and can therefore favor survival of larval species, which are important as they drive adult population dynamics. 
Due to the growing human population, however, there has been a further increase in urbanization, and many coastal habitats are being replaced by artificial structures, such as jetty seawalls and breakwaters, to support expanding commercial, residential, and tourist activities. These artificial structures can change normal functioning of an ecosystem, which can create a chain effect on the natural species present, as they have different physical properties, which can then provide suitable and favorable conditions that could support different species. Despite these effects, there is still quite a large gap in the understanding of the impacts artificial structures have on the replacement of natural habitats. It is therefore important to determine the larval species composition associated with both habitats so that the biological and ecological implications of this can be assessed in a context of potential habitat loss and or provision. The overall aim of this project is therefore to evaluate the use by coastal and intertidal larvae of artificial and natural structures along the Eastern Cape coastline. The objectives are to determine and compare the composition of coastal larval assemblages that are associated with artificial and natural structures, as well as contribute to the field of larval taxonomy by conducting DNA analysis on selected larval taxa. As independent case studies, Fieldwork was conducted at a natural site and at an artificial site. Four replicated habitats were selected, two habitats at a natural site, which were rock pools and gullies at Kenton on Sea, and two artificial structures at the Port Alfred Marina, which were jetties and vertical walls. Samples were collected using light traps and a submersible pump, which targeted and collected phototactic and photoneutral larval species, respectively. Light traps were deployed for two nights and pumping was also done at deployment locations over two days across six consecutive months during spring low tide. Environmental parameters of pH, salinity and temperature were also collected over the sampling period. All preserved specimens were counted and identified to the lowest possible taxonomic level using a microscope as well as using DNA barcoding techniques. Counts of specimens collected in traps indicate higher larval assemblages in artificial structures as compared to natural structures. At Kenton, the total amount of invertebrates collected in the light traps were 27, comprising 9 taxa. Additionally, only 2 fish larvae were collected. At the gullies, the most common species collected were the megalope of Pertunidae species, and at the rock pools, the megalope of Pinothera species and the zoea of xanthidae species were equally dominant, with no significant interaction between microhabitats and month. At the marina, the total amount of invertebrates collected in the light traps were over 2 million, comprising 20 taxa. Additionally, 712 fish larvae were collected, comprising 18 taxa. There were significant differences between the jetties and vertical walls across months for invertebrate and fish larvae with the zoea of Pinothera species being the most abundant taxon collected at both habitats, making up over 90% of the total invertebrate larvae collected. Pinothera zoea were, however, significantly higher at the jetties as compared to the vertical walls and contributed most to the dissimilarity between these habitats. For the fish larvae, the preflection stage of the Blenny omobranchus woodi was significantly higher at the jetties and the post-lection stage of the herring Etromius whiteheadi significantly higher at the vertical walls. Low numbers of both invertebrate and fish larval specimens collected at Kenton could be attributed to the design of the light traps. Traps were often badly damaged due to exposure to high wave energy and in certain instances were completely lost. High numbers of naturally occurring species in the marina suggest that artificial structures may provide shallow and protected areas which offers refuge for vulnerable early life stages of species, acting as potential nursery grounds, which in turn can play a potential facilitative role for replenishment of natural populations. Overall, certain artificial structures within coastal areas could act as possible hotspots for early stage biodiversity, and heightened conservation efforts should therefore be considered for these areas. And a special thank you to everyone that assisted me and provided funding. Thanks for listening, everyone. Next, we have Russell Dixon, MSC.
Hello everyone, my name is Russell Dixon and I'm going to tell you a bit about the last two results chapters from my master's thesis, which has been looking at the movement patterns of giant kingfish from South Africa and Mozambique, with specific reference to two large-scale aggregation sites. Giant kingfish, commonly known as GTs, play a key role in marine ecosystems as apex predators and have even been documented to take birds out of the air. It is thus no surprise that they are a prized recreational fishing species and contribute to global economies through this. Previous research has been conducted at the world's largest recorded aggregation of GTs in southern Mozambique, where thousands of individuals gather during summer on the full moons in order to breed. There has also been evidence that some of these individuals move into South African waters, and this is where my research comes in. 43 giant kingfish were tagged, some at the Ponta de Oro aggregation in southern Mozambique and the rest throughout their South African distribution. The yellow dots you can see are the 104 acoustic receivers, which were moored along the coastline at these stations and were used to monitor their movements. Note the position of the Mtentu River, which we will deal with shortly. And also note the demarcated zones, which are 170 kilometer stretches of coastline. For the upcoming slide. 26 adults had sufficient data for analysis of up to six years and what you're now looking at are latitudinal detection plots for each fish. Let's look at ID 28 as an example. The dotted line going across is the latitude of the Mozambique aggregation site and you can see that each year during summer it goes up to breed and then returns for the remainder of the year to its preferred latitude before migrating again the following year. And if you look at the figure as a whole, it's clear that all fish are migrating basically every year to Mozambique in order to breed. Now, this has important implications for management straight away, because if the southern Mozambique aggregation were to be overexploited, this would have dire implications for the entire South African stock. Additionally, it's clear that different individuals have different preferred latitudes of site fidelity. So the top row remain in Mozambique year round, whereas the bottom row prefer zone D as their home range. Now within zone D is the Mtentu River, which hosts a globally unique aggregation of giant kingfish. It has been documented by BBC and narrated by Sir David Attenborough. Adult giant kingfish swim up the river periodically during summer, where they can be seen in their many hundreds circling on the top of the water and performing other strange patterns. There is actually tremendous tourist potential for this because you can watch it from the cliffs of this pristine river. But nobody has actually known why this happens or been able to predict exactly when it's going to be visible. This is the Mtentu River. Take note of the positions of the three acoustic receivers, the top one of which is about four kilometers upstream. Ten giant kingfish were tagged here, the smallest one being 43 centimeters fork length, ranging to over a meter. Uh, sufficient detections were received from eight of these individuals, and while this is a small sample size, some very clear trends have emerged. These are schematic detection plots of each individual, ordered from smallest to largest. And the first thing to note is clear daily trends. Using Fish 41 as an example, each day it swims upstream spends most of the midday period upstream and then swims back down by nightfall and this is repeated day after day. Interesting to note though they are not always in the river and there's some periods where almost all individuals are out at sea for a few days. So various environmental variables were included in statistical modeling and what came out is that sea temperature is the main predictor variable. So during periods of warm sea temperature almost all fish are out at sea well, when the sea is cold, it seems that all of, almost all of the fish come in for thermal refuge. Now this makes sense because giant kingfish is a tropical or subtropical species and they seem to be making use of the warm surface freshwater layer during the summer months in the Mtentu River. Now there are still some unanswered questions and still many other theories out there that may have some truth in them. But one thing that is clear is that we need to, to continue to protect these precious environments. And finally, big thank yous must go to the many people and organizations that have been involved with this research. Long live the kingfish!
Up next is Roxanne, who is an MSc student. Hi there, my name is Roxanne Juby, and I'm sharing my research on dogfish distribution patterns at Alboa Bay's rocky reefs. Dogfish demonstrate complex distribution patterns across temporal and spatial scales, and these have important implications for fisheries management. Dogfish in South Africa are poorly understood, particularly at nearshore rocky reefs. This is because past research largely used tro trawling surveys, and there's still considerable taxonomic uncertainty about the species composition in the region. For this study, we only identified individuals down to genus level. To investigate the day and night distributions of dogfish at Algoa Bay shallow photic and deep subphotic reefs, we investigated dogfish abundance in the form of max n, size structure, and sex ratio. We then explored the role of the biotic and abiotic environmental conditions driving the observed patterns. To do this, we looked at competition, predation risk, water temperature, and depth zone. Baited remote underwater stereo video systems, or stereo broths, fitted with a red light source and temperature logger were used as the sampling method. Two reefs, Cape Reef and Rye Banks in Algoa Bay were sampled according to a stratified random sampling approach whereby three habitat types, high profile reef, low profile reef and intermittent sandy reef patches were sampled. Each reef was sampled at a shallow photic zone and deep subphotic zone and the range of these were determined during a pilot study. Each depth zone at each reef was sampled at both day and night time, at least one hour after sunrise and sunset. A negative binomial generalized linear model, or GLM, was applied to investigate relative abundance of dogfish in response to depth zone and time of day. On the right, you can see the predicted average abundances of dogfish at shallow photic and deep subphotic reefs across three different habitat types. Relative abundances along the y-axis and depth zone is on the x-axis. A similar pattern was seen across all reef habitats. At shallow photic reefs, significantly higher abundances were predicted at night compared to day, and fewer individuals were recorded at shallow photic compared to deep subphotic reefs. A Gaussian GLM with a log link was used to investigate dogfish size in response to the treatment and we found that significantly larger dogfish were recorded on shallow photic reefs at night compared to subphotic reefs at day and night. By recording the number of individuals with claspers present, we found that males dominated the surveyed population, constituting 92% of the population. A negative binomial GLM was applied to the total abundance of the reef fish community to investigate the level of competition in response to time of day and depth zone. We found that at both reefs, total fish abundance was significantly higher at photic reefs at day compared to all other treatments. To investigate predation risk, a non-parametric Mann-Whitney U test was applied to the total abundance of all large sharks seen in the study. Unfortunately, large sharks were rare and showed no relationship with dogfish abundance. In fact, average dogfish abundance was higher in the presence of large sharks compared to when they were absent. This, however, was insignificant. A Gaussian GLM applied to the water temperature data showed that photic reefs were significantly warmer than subphotic reefs, irrespective of time of day. To summarize the observed patterns, number one, a higher abundance was recorded at night on photic reefs, therefore suggesting that dial movements are occurring here. Dogfish recorded at night on photic reefs were larger than those recorded on subphotic reefs, therefore suggesting that size segregation also occurs. Number three, consistent day and night abundances and size structures on subphotic reefs with individuals below 462 millimeters suggest that those undertaking the dial movement are moving from an alternative diurnal habitat. Number four, sex segregation is clear as males dominated the observed reef population. And lastly, there's definitely a photic preference at play as typically dogfish were only recorded in low light and dark environments. The observed patterns have two major implications. Number one, sex segregation patterns may increase the population susceptibility to selective exploitation and skewed population ratios. Without knowledge of the female habitat, the extent of this is difficult to determine and there is a need for this research in future. The observed habitat selection patterns by young male dogfish in the bay may make them less susceptible to harvesting, particularly by trawl which is restricted to sandy bottomed habitats. 
Although rocky reefs are subject to high levels of lion fishing, there is no current market value for dogfish in South Africa and they may be released from the hook. There is a need for continued monitoring of catch data and improved reporting of catch composition for our dogfish. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, our last presenter for this session is Ashita, who is an MSc student. Hello everyone, my name is Ashika and I will be presenting but a portion of my master's study on dogfish distribution and diets. Squalus acutibinus and Squalus bassi are the most common dogfish species found around South Africa showing overlap in their distributions. They are similar in morphology and are presumed to be similar in resource requirements and may be partitioning their resources as a measure of reducing intraspecific and interspecific interactions. These sharks are mesopredators, and given the psychological role and understanding of the distribution and feeding ecology is important as it may provide insights into the dynamics of the marine food web. To date, there is little literature that focuses on these sharks, and so our understanding of the ecological role and impact is limited. The study therefore aimed to determine the potential intraspecific and interspecific variability in habitat and resource use by and between species by coast depth and size class. All data were collected during routine demersal surveys conducted by DFFE on the western south coast of South Africa. The study area extended from the Orange River to Port Elizabeth and Cape Agulhas formed the border between the two coasts. In terms of distribution, catch data were used to determine distributions. Chi-square contingency tables were computed to allow for intraspecific and interspecific evaluation of habitat use, and classical wallace tests were used to determine interspecific density differences. In terms of diet, samples were collected opportunistically during various surveys and were analyzed by means of stomach content analyses. Six major prey categories were considered when identifying prey. The diet of each species was then quantified by four relative indices of prey importance. And intraspecific and interspecific differences in the frequency of occurrence of prey items among the major prey categories were tested using chi square contingency tables. For Squalus acutipinus, there was a significant difference in the size of sharks between the two coasts, and the chi-square test revealed significant differences in the size composition of sharks with depth on both coasts. Small individuals were more frequently sampled at shallow depths, and as the depth increased, the average size of the sharks could increase. Similar patterns were evident for Squalus bassi. In terms of interspecific distributions, there was an overlap in the distributions at intermediate depths and significant differences in the size of overlapping species were evident at certain depths on each coast. Moreover, interspecific density differences by depth were also evident as revealed by the classical wallace tests. In terms of diet of squalus acutipinus, differences in the diet of sharks were evident between coast, depth, and size class. Teleos, cephalopods, crustaceans, and polychaetes were important prey categories in the diet of Squalus acutipinus, with a degree of importance changing with coast, depth, and size class. In terms of the diet of Squalus bassi, significant differences in the diet was evident by depth and size classes. And overall, teleos, cephalopods, and crustaceans were important prey categories in the diet of squalus bassi, with a degree of importance changing with coast, depth, and size class. In terms of the interspecific differences in the diet, large sharks differed significantly in their diets at the 150 meter and 250 meter depths on both coasts. These sharks fed on the same resources but in different proportions, and the degree of importance of each dietary category differed between the species. This study has provided various lines of evidence in the support for intra and interspecific variability in the distribution and diets of squalus acutipinus and squalus bassi. Distribution patterns were inferred to be as a result of competitive interactions, ontogenetic changes with growth, habitat and dietary requirements, as well as as a result of reduced predation risk. Not forgetting that some of the observed patterns may be as a result of environmental conditions and tolerance. Moreover, the dietary habits of these species were inferred to be as a result of regional differences in prey spectrums, competitive interactions, ontogenetic shifts, and prey handling abilities. Interpreting the results in the context of competition alone is often difficult, as there is little evidence that resources are limited. And as with many other studies, the limitations of the data collected needs to be recognized. Cascading effects 
of the removal of mesopredators have been widely documented and having comprehensive ecological knowledge of these species will allow for risk assessments to be undertaken that can contribute to fisheries management. Overall, these sharks are versatile predators that are non-randomly distributed and show plasticity in the diet showcasing different roles that they may play in the ecosystem. Further studies are recommended because these species are likely endemics in this region and as commercial fisheries fish deeper, they will likely exploit greater proportions of their populations. I would just like to thank everyone so much for supporting the study, whether it was academically, financially or emotionally, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, we are now entering the Q&A part of the session. So if you have questions, please, you can type them either on the, on the chat or you can raise your hand so we can uh, pick you up and you can ask your question live. Uh, so for the chat, please write the name of the person that the question is directed to so we can, so that they can answer. All right, yeah, so you can, in the meantime, you can also vote for the best uh, uh, presentation on the uh, from, from this session. So you can choose your best MSc and uh, so as the best PhD presentation. Right, so far it doesn't, doesn't seem like there are any questions for any of the presenters, um, which means maybe suggests that all the presentations were clear. So we still have just a bit of time for questions. So if anyone has a question, please don't be shy to type it in the chat or raise your hand up. Thank you very much, Pilo. All right, thank you everyone. I, I think we've come to the end of our session two. Thanks for your participation. Right. Uh, please don't forget to to vote for your best MSc or PhD 
uh, presentation while we wait for uh, from the breakout room. Um, before we go for a tea break. <laughs> 